I am Kami and I'm working in Papua New Guinea, in the highlands of Papua New Guinea uh, since 2018, October. Um, I do have some photos to share, but probably at the end of a little bit long <laughs> destiny that I have. But uh, the place where I'm working is, um, is one of the 13 most um, disadvantaged uh, districts of uh, Papua New Guinea. And Kompiam, this place, uh, it was the deep highlands, the deep jungles, and it was discovered by the outside world only um, in the 1940s, which is less than 30 years, uh, less than 70 years. Um, so more about the place in a bit, but um, um, since this is my destiny, I probably should start from uh, much earlier in my life. Um, before I wanna say that, I wanna say EMFI, has played a big role in my life. I remember in 2008, uh, when I was one year in, uh, into BDS, I went for the EMFI biennial conference to Gurgaon. And that's where I um, first saw pictures of the Bondo tribes and the Asha Kiran Hospital in Orissa and uh, heard about Dr. Weepi and uh, Dr. Varghese Philip and Dr. Nirmala. Uh, that's also where I heard about uh, Dr. Bina Sam uh, where she was working and how she got malaria 16 times, I think. And so the EMFI conference really opened my eyes, um, uh, stirred something in my heart. But much before EMFI, um, uh, to talk a bit about my childhood, I grew up in a very um, strict Catholic home. Uh, very um, faithful Catholics go to church every Sunday say our rosaries every uh, day. Um, and so I was, my faith was informed in my Catholic upbringing. And um, um, the thing with us Catholics is we go to church and we follow those things very well, but we don't really read our Bibles <laughs> that much. Uh, but I, I fortunately had an uncle, my mother's brother, who uh, had an encounter with Jesus uh, in his life. And, uh, and he gave me my first, you know, big Bible. Uh, it had the New Testament and Old Testament. Others used to walk about with the little uh, New Testament Bible. So uh, he gave me the Bible. And along with that, he gave me a small pocket uh, prayer book. And in that pocket prayer book, uh, there was prayers. And there were two particular portions of the Bible that I ended up reading almost every day of my teenage life, which is Isaiah 61 where uh, uh, he talks about, I've come to set the bond of, bond, bondage, those in bondage free, I've come to uh, bind the brokenhearted, um, that particular portion which Jesus also uh, talks about. Um, and the other, uh, other verse that I used to read almost every um, day was Psalm 51, which is um, David's penitence uh, psalm. This is the psalm he writes after uh, he murders uh, uh, Bathsheba's husband and commits adultery with her. So these are, this is basically my upbringing, um, dwelling on Psalm 51 and Isaiah 61 almost every day uh, of my teenage life. Um, not really the rest of the Bible, but for us uh, in the Catholic Church, uh, the, the readings are from the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Psalms. And so as I went to church, um, those readings would really stir my heart. And um, along with the readings and the stories of saints, you know, saints and martyrs, which really, um, you know, called me to something more. Uh, this particular song that we just sang, which is I, the Lord of Sea and Sky, um, it, it uh, would stir my heart every time we sang that. We sang that almost once in four Sundays during communion or during entrance hymns. And this is around age 12 when uh, uh, I'm paying more attention to the word and uh, the song is stirring my heart. And the refrain of this uh, song is from uh, Isaiah 6 and 1 Samuel 3, where uh, Samuel responds to God's call and Isaiah also responds to God's call. And uh, the interesting part in 1 Samuel 3 is really uh, that if you read that, it says Samuel did not know the Lord uh, at that time yet, but he just obeyed what Eli had uh, told him to do. Um, anyway, so around age 12, uh, I'm, I'm a city bred girl. I was born in a city. I was, my whole schooling is in city. So I didn't really know much of rural India um, 
but I used to hear stories from the domestic helps. Uh, the, the, the maid servants used to come and work for us. Uh, we had uh, some coming from the slums of Chennai. We had some coming from the tribes of Orissa. And those were my, uh, my um, inputs into rural India. So I remember when I was uh, about 12 years of age, my, uh, my domestic help, her name is Sunita. She told me that whenever her parents need to go to the hospital, uh, they had to walk for four days um, through the jungles, carry their sick on probably a bamboo cot and uh, uh, traverse rivers and maybe get a bullock cart, maybe, um, um, you know, if there's some public transport, they get. It. And I looked at her and I said, stop lying. You just need to take an auto or a cab. Why are you lying to me? And, um, but you know what she said really stuck to my head. And uh, it was around that time um, that a neighbor of us who was a Tamilian Brahmin, he, um, he, well, I was playing with his daughter one day and he said, come look at this email. And it, it, at that time there was no social media as such. So this email was basically an email which was showing the difference between you know, kids in Africa versus kids in America. Uh, so you had somebody, you know, a white kid <laughs> biting into a cheeseburger, whereas the, the picture next to it was of these African children you know, just scraping the empty uh, vessel. So uh, these kind of stark differences, and I know something stirred in my heart then. So it, it really started with this whole uh, idea of, you know, this, this social poverty and justice and uh, those kind of things was what really stirred my heart. Um, then, uh, so there were two places I really wanted to go to. One was Af uh, Orissa, because my maidservant's parents, uh, you know, had a tough time getting to hospital. And... Uh, uh, in Africa, because all the world's poor people are in Africa. Uh, so, um, so this was something that I kept in my heart. And um, after schooling, I dropped the year and um, uh, I went to Kerala uh, just to study for the entrance exams. It was then that, you know, there was nothing much to do. And so I read the New Testament from cover to cover, really. Um, and as I was reading the New Testament, I was just amazed at how wonderful Jesus is. Um, I used to love reading John Grisham, and uh, John Grisham's uh, novels are basically, um, they talk about a lot of, uh, you know, the protagonist is like a lawyer who's fighting for justice. So while I was reading the New Testament, I was like, Jesus is the best John Grisham protagonist there ever was. He's just so cool. And I remember particularly while I was reading John chapter four, and um, uh, I stumbled upon how he interacted with the woman at the well. I was just amazed at how wonderfully he treated the woman. And I was like, oh, you know, if I want to marry a man, I probably want to marry someone who's like Jesus, probably why I'm still not married. But anyway, um, so uh, that was a very formative year, but uh, I was very Catholic. So um, I had no idea who the Protestants were really. I just knew there were some Pentecostals and all of that. Uh, so uh, I wrote uh, the entrance exams to nine different universities, colleges, but I ended up only in CMC uh, and that too in dentistry. Now I've always wanted to be a doctor, I've always wanted to be a missionary doctor because I wanted to serve. And uh, um, CMC, when I, when I got admission into dentistry, I was, I was kicking and screaming. I was telling my mother, no, I don't want to get into this. this I'm going to drop another year. It's like, how on earth am I going to do any missionary work with dentistry. I mean, even middle-class people in India can't really afford dent, uh, dentistry, dental treatment. Um, and my professors and some of my batchmates who, who were with me, uh, who also shared the same burden of wanting to get into MBBS but not being able to. Uh, so we, we kicked and, you know, screamed for five years, but uh, God was so good in, you know, uh, uh, forming us at that time. So when I came to CMC Ludhiana, that was the first time I realized that there were so many denominations and in a batch of 40, there were just so many different denominations. But what really, really moved me was uh, um, some of my classmates who, who, who lived the Bible, who just exuded, you know, Christ-likeness from their life. And I was so drawn to them. And uh, along with my classmates, there were my professors and my seniors and some juniors later on, who, uh, they really stirred my heart. And uh, so, I was just very amazed at how I was very excited to, you know, finally get this Bible exposition and um, go for Thursday EU meetings and Sunday um, 
uh, EGF meetings. And I, I, I really grew. I was very hungry for the word because I just read the New Testament. And I was just drinking it all in. And um, I remember at that time, my mother, who is very, very Catholic, she said, don't you dare enter another church. But I didn't think it was very logical. And so I entered another church. And um, I was amazed at, you know, just how beautiful uh, the word was exposed in, in uh, the evangelical Pentecostal uh, church over there. But um, I, I would go to the evangelical church in the mornings and I'd go to the Catholic church in the evenings and try to balance that. Uh, but those, those years were very formative years for me. <clears throat> um, uh, in, in college, um, I don't know how many of you are dentists, but in our college at that time, there was a lot of patient hunting that we had to do. We had to walk the streets of Ljubljana and try and convince people to come and uh, you know, finish their quotas. Um, and when I walk the streets of Ljubljana, you see a lot. You, you peer into houses, you come across drug addicts. Uh, you, uh, yeah, and I remember one particular day we went to this um, 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 com company uh, where there were a lot of these laborers, workers, and we were trying to tell them about, you know, dental hygiene. And they just seemed so, it was just so new to them. They were so eager to listen to it. And we used to go as a group and I saw that I really liked telling them about, you know, you know, this is but something what you can do to take care of your oral health, perhaps. But anyway, that was, you know, the kickstart of my, uh, my interest in communities. Um, so after uh, college uh, life, um, we have bond. And so that's how I ended up going to Orissa for one year. I worked in Bism Katak. And uh, in Bism Katak, uh, it was completely different because I grew up in Delhi. And uh, um, this was a community where malaria was endemic and you had patients coming with TB, uh, you know, not able to stay in the hospital for the entire course, not even willing to stay for their malaria course um, because, you know, they had their cattle out in the field and if the, if the cow dies, the entire family, you know, is left uh, without food and they would come only once in six months because uh, that's when the harvest happened. So I was just, you know, exposed to the real rural life and the pains of the people and it was over there that I saw my you know first uh, I think rural oral cancer patient who had in fact uh, walked for four days <laughs> to come to the hospital and so that's when I knew that my uh, domestic health wasn't lying and uh, yeah um, anyway so um, after my bond I was I was very willing and happy to continue there because I just loved uh, working in Orissa but my mom said it, you know it's time to come back to Delhi and I came back to Delhi and I came back to a private practice. Um, and that was like a big uh, um, blow to me because I had just come from this situation and uh, my boss of the pri uh, private practice told me, okay, when the patient walks in, you look at his shoes, you look at his shirt and look at what vehicle he's come, from, uh, he's come in. And then we'll decide, you know, how much we charge him. And I, I, that just blew me. I was like, what are you saying? Do you know where I'm coming from? And uh, so I thought that was like a very hard time uh, in, you know, my life, I, I didn't want to, uh, I didn't do dentistry uh, to, to work like that. But this is something, if you don't take away anything from this entire talk, please take away this. It's, it's really the Genesis 50, 20 principle uh, where, you know, Joseph tells his brothers uh, that what you meant for evil, God has uh, done good, God has brought good out of. And this is, this is like a principle that has played over and over in my life and I have, uh, learn to really trust the goodness of God in this. And what I thought was a time of dissonance in my life uh, was actually God really opening my eyes to, uh, to how to run a clinic. And you don't learn that in a college. You learn that in private practice. You, you learn uh, the things that you don't learn in college, you learn through you know, what private practitioners can teach you with their uh, skills, with the machines, with the technology that they have. So I was very grateful for that later on. But that, that particular time was, it was a culture shock for me coming back to Delhi, even though I grew up in Delhi. And uh, so um, um, I left dentistry for nine months. I was very disillusioned. And I thought, I, uh, this is not why I did dentistry. This is not why I wanted to you know, work if it was only to serve for money. And at that time, uh, I joined EHA and I went to Kashmir uh, uh, as the disability advocacy coordinator for disabled. So the Kashmir 2014, um, there was a flood over there. And so I went in the aftermath of the flood 
And my job was really to go to 20 different village, villages and uh, you know, just survey uh, what the disabled had lost and how the disaster had affected them. So it was during these uh, you know, village visits and seeing the problems in Kashmir and um, yeah, even the violence and how many people were disabled because of the violence there. Um, but yeah, I was working with the people in Kashmir that um, I, I really enjoyed the, the community work again. But there was something in me that was uh, missing being a doctor because I really liked, liked the one-on-one -on -one with patients. And so uh, uh, I came back um, and I told God, see, I can't work in a private clinic. Um, it's not gonna work for me, so you need to do something. But it was a time of waiting. Uh, and I finally got into an urban poor clinic in central Delhi and I worked there for three years. And it was very interesting because I could serve a wide variety of patients. There were rickshaw pullers who would come to me, but there were also business tycoons who would come to me. So it was very fulfilling in that way. And uh, it's, it's over there that I really understood how to be relational with patients, you know, and I realized that the dental chair is not just a dental chair. It's, uh, I mean, I joke, it's, it's, it's like a mental chair. There they were, they were women who would come and, you know, sit on my chair, women who were wives of uh, migrant laborers or, you know, um, business people who'd never get who never got, gotten out of their house except uh, to come to a doctor. And they would open up and they would, uh, you know, um, sometimes cry. And so it, it, it became a very relational thing. I learned how to value my patients uh, during that time. There were some amazing stories of how people who never thought would know Jesus, you know, uh, had actually uh, heard the gospel and had given their lives and were ousted by their families. But that was a beautiful time. But I kept having visions of working, uh, you know, uh, somewhere because Orissa was done. My next focus was Africa. So by hook or by crook, I really wanted to go to Africa. And, uh, <clears throat> um, but at that time, my mother wanted me to go and work in Kuwait. And that was really not my will or my plan. So I, uh, I again, kicked and screamed and I went to Kuwait and I worked there for two weeks and I didn't like it at all. And I kept fighting with God and I was like, you know this, I don't want to work here. Why are you bringing me here? But uh, during those two weeks, um, yeah, there was another experience where I realized God was asking me to just surrender to him, to trust him. And I remember very particularly going down on my knees one day in Kuwait and saying, okay, you know what? I'm not God. You are God. Your will be done. If this is what I have to, this is where I have to work, so be it. And I remember kneeling down, praying and getting up. And then I get a call saying, oh, the, the Kuwait thing is not happening. We probably have to go back home. I was like, really? God just wanted me to surrender. That's, that, that was his whole plan. Anyway, I came back and I continued working in this urban poor clinic. And uh, slowly, you know, uh, an opportunity opened up for DR Congo. Uh, and I was very excited, except that this was in Kinshasa, the capital city, and it was going to be a sister hospital of... Uh, Fortis or SRS diagnostic. Basically, this was a hospital that catered to the diplomats of Kinshasa. But in my mind, I had, you know, convinced myself saying, hey, Africa, I'm, I'm sure I can go and work, you know, with the poor over there. And, um, but at that time, my father had, you know, uh, this, uh, he had ataxia and vertigo and my mom was not home and my sister was not home and I was the only one there. And it was again, God just slamming the door on my face. And, um, I remember, you know, being on the phone to con to um, uh, to confirm my yellow fever vaccination and seeing my dad go through uh, this whole vomiting session and with a very reluctant heart, I said, okay, no. And again, you know, it was God putting me down on my knees and saying, just surrender. And uh, those are two uh, incidents, in instances where God really showed me to trust him and not myself, that I'm not God. Uh, and then in 2017, um, 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 yeah, in 2017, two of my friends, one was in uh, one was in Orissa and one was in Africa. So this is Dr. Prerit, uh, uh, Pre 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 Thomas Jacob, who was a surgeon uh, from CMC Velo. He did his uh, BDS, uh, he did his MBBS in Ludhiana, and he was someone I really looked up to. He was uh, an uh, senior in EU. He was such a Beautiful, beautiful uh, child of God. Um, he was working in Orissa as a surgeon and his wife was my very good friend, Shaila. And uh, I heard in January, 2017, they'd gone for a hospital picnic and uh, uh, he had drowned and died. And uh, 
um, in September of that year, uh, Shane Sam Matthew, who um, um, who's the son of uh, one of the CMI members, Elizabeth, uh, he was one of the first uh, dental uh, <clears throat> missionaries to Liberia. Uh, I mean, he was one of the uh, dental uh, missionaries to Liberia, and Liberia is one of the first international outstations of CDC. And he uh, died in a fire accident uh, in September. And uh, this is one in Odisha and one in Africa. And it really shook me. It was like, God was asking me, do you really know what you're asking for? And I had to really sit down and think about this. And it was at that time that I was reading uh, The Hiding Place, a book by Cory Ten Boom, uh, his, her autobiography. And in that, there's a particular portion uh, where um, Cory just realizes that she escaped death. And she comes to her sister and says, what if I did not you know, hear you and I did not get up from my bed? But uh, her sister says, Cory, there are no ifs in God's world. The safest place is the center of his will and maybe always know it. And reading that just absolutely strengthened my heart because there are no ifs in God's world. And um, this, and along with Matthew chapter 10, uh, verse 28, where it says, do not fear those who can kill your body, uh, but can do nothing to your soul. And that assured me to really rely on God. Um, so that's how I ended up in PNG. That was uh, Dr. Ebi and Dr. VP. He, uh, they, um, um, they uh, were instrumental in the whole PNG um, um, thing happening. So um, in 2017 is when I heard about PNG. And uh, PNG is, um, if you look at the pe people in the highlands, they have very Afro hair. And so I keep joking that God was just showing me visions of Africa, but he actually meant Papua New Guinea. Um, but um, um, yeah, the 2017 uh, was when PNG opened, but it was only by the end of 2018 that I ended up in PNG. And there's one year in uh, the first year in PNG was a time of great trying because um, uh, it was a year of God really teaching me patience. My equipment, we, we were setting up a clinic in a place that had never seen a dentist before. Uh, I, I was only the second dentist in the entire province of the state and the first dentist in the district. It's a district of about 60,000 people. And uh, so this was this is a mission hospital. I'll show you pictures in a bit. And um, uh, yeah, the doctor here, Dr. David Mills, who's an Australian who had been who has been here for 23 years, uh, is just a visionary. And he thought, yeah, why not? Why not dentistry? And that's how I ended up here. But my entire equipment that was supposed to come from India took about a year. So that that was God teaching me a lesson in patience. But it was also a lesson in what this really what really this place is, the culture of this place, uh, the tradition of this place. And I remember uh, one of my patients who came to me um, and I saw him get, did, a, did some treatment and um, had to give an appointment for later on uh, for the next week. But in the middle of this week, he was killed point, point blank. Uh, um, he was walking down the road to his house and some people high on marijuana who were uh, from the other tribe just shot him. And that was the first time that it really hit me that this place is quite violent. But slowly, I also realized that in the hills of Papua New Guinea, whenever tribes, um, you know, have a have fights, Kompiam is known for tribal fights. And whenever there's a fight, and when one tribe has killed somebody of the other tribe, they they sing out, they sing the whole thing. This and that that's called a sing sing, and they basically sing their their victory over the other tribe. So over the months, every time when I heard songs in the hills, it would you know, trigger a bit of anxiety in me uh, because I was just like, I don't know who's gonna come up next uh, in the hospital dead. But um, anyway, um, uh, yeah, so uh, Papua New Guinea was, the, that first year was a big year of trying and trial and uh, God really showed me uh, what he was calling me to. And that song, I keep going back to that song, I, the Lord of Sea and Sky. I've heard my people cry, all who dwell in dark and sin. Uh, not to say that we in Delhi or Kerala or Chennai are not dwelling in dark and sin. Uh, we have our own darknesses, but 
Kumbiam in a way was just a very real, um, uh, real uh, basic uh, view into what life can be. Um, yeah, so maybe I can show you some pictures and then as I show you pictures, it could probably make more sense. Is that visible? Yes, Kami. Okay, so PNG is a pretty uh, beautiful country. A um, lot of birds, animals, colors, and the people are so beautiful. The children are so beautiful. Uh, the man on, on the right is Pastor Lava, who's one of the first believers in, uh, in Kumpiam and very instrumental in getting this hospital uh, in place. Um, the culture shows are very interesting. I, I work in Enga, Enga province, and this is the traditional dress of the people. This is one of the festivals. Uh, and um, Coca-Cola is a big thing in Papua New Guinea. Uh, in the deepest of tribes and villages, you can find Coca-Cola and Maggi, but we'll go there later. Other things are just like we have our pan and gutka. Here it's absolutely raw, the, the beetle quid and the hand rolled cigarettes and the smoke. Young man, old lady, three-year-old child, all of them on it. Other things that really plague this place are domestic violence. Sorry, there are, there's gonna be some pictures that are not very nice. Uh, yeah, so initially the tribal fights used to be with bow and arrows, now it's gone to guns. And uh, other things that plague this place is sorcery accusation related violence. Uh, not particularly Kumpiam, but in the other places in Papua New Guinea, this patient on the left was chopped by the second wife. She's the first wife. So domestic violence is huge. For those of you who are not sure where Papua New Guinea is, um, yeah, it's above Australia right there. Port Mosby is the capital. Uh, and from there, it's a one hour flight. There's no roads to the highlands, uh, to Mount Hagen. And from there, it's a four hour drive. Two hours is Highland, uh, Highland Highway and then two hours is deep jungle. So this is uh, a bit of Enga. So these are how our roads are. Um, sometimes we have to make, build our own bridges. This is Dr. David Mills. Sometimes he builds bridges as he goes. Sometimes there are landslides. That's how uh, the roads are. So you can imagine how pregnant women and people who need uh, healthcare reach the place. So this is Kompiam. So if you drive two hours from the highway, uh, into the deep mountains. This is where you reach, it's on a plateau. This entire, all the buildings that you see, uh, basically part of the hospital. And uh, the long stretch of land over there is the airstrip. Um, and we have, yeah, uh, we use this airstrip to go to the rest of the district. People walk for one hour, two days, five days, just to get to hospital. hospital. <clears throat> um, that's Dr. David Mills and his wife and his children, and he um, fosters many uh, Papua New Guinean children as well. Uh, he was here for 23 years, and last year the family uh, returned back to Australia. Uh, and this is Dr. Rebecca and her little girl, Bina. So he trained a Papua New Guinean uh, to take his place, and he set, really, he's the one who set the uh, community medicine and uh, rural medicine in Papua New Guinea. Uh, he's, he's a big visionary. So this was the hospital he came to. And when I came, this was how, uh, this is what I came to. Uh, this hospital was built in 1975, uh, uh, 19, yeah, around that time uh, when the Baptist missionaries came to this land and uh, uh, preached. Uh, this was a little health center at that time. And when he came in 1999, uh, this is what it was. The surgical theater was nearby. It's very similar actually to many uh, mission hospitals in India. I keep thinking Manali has a uh, similar story. Uh, Bisam Katak, where I worked, has a similar story. Uh, so yeah, this was what I worked with for one year. It was an office chair. This man who was assisting me was the de dental orderly. He's the one who had extracted all the teeth of this place before me. And uh, yeah, he had salvaged a chair from somewhere and uh, the story of how this this uh, this unit, which is like a portable unit, that's another story in itself. I thought we wouldn't need it, but that's what sustained me for a year. I ended up getting a bit of sciatica because I had to work like that. 
but my things came back, uh, came, came through in a year. And uh, it took about eight different nationalities to set the clinic up. And that was the old building. Then Dr. Mills has been progressively uh, building buildings here. So this is the new building. And this is in front of my dental clinic. And this is the new clinic uh, where I am. So Papua New Guinea, uh, the highlands are basically a lot of rainforest. And uh, the Kumpiam district caters to about 11 different uh, health aid posts. And the only way to reach these thick rainforests are basically you either fly or you do or you walk. You walk for a few hours or days or you fly. So this is one of our walking patrols. Uh, we went a little, maybe an hour by the by, by road. And then we were taking the vaccine fridge down. So we had to walk for another hour with this vaccine fridge uh, to this aid post of us crossing rivers. And once we reached there, Dr. Mills, uh, who is just a man of different uh, capabilities, he uh, <clears throat> would set the solar machine and you know build houses, and then he would go and see patients. Uh, now, this is the little ward in our uh, aid post over there. And each patient, there were about six beds, and each patient in that um, ward had a story of their own. Uh, um, yeah, this particular kid that you see with uh, her leg like that, she was chopped by her uncle. Uh, um, and the story goes that, you know, uh, the, the neighbor had robbed their banana tree. And so somebody got killed. And in retaliation, the little child got chopped. Uh, this family that you see down, uh, the mother is four months pregnant, but there was uh, some violence uh, in the house. The man bet her up and she was on crawling on, a, on her uh, knees when we met her. But this little child who was beside, beside this man, he uh, had a huge swollen face because uh, I, had to extract it, I had to extract four of his teeth because of the infection. Uh, but yeah, that's just to show what the problems are. So that's what we do um, first time telling them about the fluoride toothpaste, how to brush, and giving them instructions. Those are some wonderful toys of the kids. Now, this story, this was one, one, one other patient who was there. She's a 17-year-old um, who was in hospital because her husband had chopped her hands. And while she was in hospital, on the market day, she went to buy some food. And the second wife saw her and chopped her legs. So when we saw her, her HB was really low and she also is HIV positive. And so we had to put her on a bamboo cot and walk, which reminded me of my 12 year old self and how my um, domestic help was telling me these stories. We took her, walked back through landslides and within two months, she was in a much better place. So we either walk or we take Mission Aviation Fellowship Please Google Mission Innovation Fellowship. There's a lot of wonderful things you can learn about it. Uh, so sometimes when the aircraft comes to pick us up, they drop patients and then we pack our bags. And as you can see, Coca-Cola and Maggie has reached the depths of the middle of nowhere. Uh, I was giving this talk somewhere and um, one, of, one missionary said, we should be spreading the gospel the way Coca-Cola and Maggie has reached the depths of the the middle of nowhere yeah anyway uh, so this is our team uh, sometimes we have uh, students from all over the world coming to volunteer uh, dr mills uh, pastor lava we go with the pastor that's how we fly uh, that little cricket pitch uh, you see is the airstrip uh, we land on that this one is the shortest airstrip in this region it's only 400 meters that's how the people wait for us this is how some of our eight posts are um, immunizations and uh, yeah, talking with the community and uh, ultrasounds, checking women and seeing if they need to get back. And then Dr. Mills is again building houses, um, fixing solar panels. And I started off with uh, education, really, dental education. And this particular picture means a lot to me because I was right here right at this moment while I was giving them a dental education, oral hygiene education. I was thinking, what on earth am I doing in the middle of nowhere? These people hardly have anything and I'm talking to them about fluoride toothpaste. 
And this man who was in, a, in the colored shirt, he got up at that moment and said, my grandfather had no idea about what you're saying. My father had no idea and I don't have any idea. And then he pulls his five-year-old kid and says, but my son should know. And it was like God was telling me in his subtle way that the only way ahead is forward. So yeah, dental education is a big part. Uh, what I've noticed is uh, really investing in kids because sometimes the adults don't really want to listen. So that's one of my clinics. <laughs> and coming from CMC and CDC, the standards of the oral surgery department in CDC, this, this really made me laugh because my first line of defense was really a garbage bag, a black garbage bag. But yeah, you learn to tweak things. Uh, in this particular place, there was no chair. And so we had to just use whatever they gave us. Uh, the back of the tree was the backrest. That's a bit of, that's a school that you see down below uh, uh, in one of the villages. Pigs are a big economic uh, thing over here. Uh, this is not Enga, but a place near uh, Enga, the uh, province nearby. Uh, this picture is significant because it actually reminds me of some homes in India and Nepal. This little house that you see under the house is where they keep their women when they're menstruating uh, because they don't want to come in contact with women like that. That's not Inga, but nearby. In, in Papua New Guinea, you have thousand different tribes and thousand different languages and uh, <laughs> thousand different cultures, really. Okay, so this is... Uh, Sometimes where we sleep, that's a cookhouse, that's what we eat. Uh, lovely taros and bananas and tapiokas and uh, yeah, Maggie noodles sometimes. And these are the markets uh, deep in the middle of nowhere. You have all these things that have reached them. Uh, lollies, sugars, biscuits, Maggie, and you have the hand rolled, the tobacco leaves and the boy, the beetle quid. So after our clinic, we take back patients that need to go to the hospital. Uh, that's just a view of how patients live uh, right on top of the mountains. Okay, now some gross pictures of some patients of mine. Uh, tongue cancer, cheek cancer, because beetle quid is, is, they have about 10 or 15 or 20 in a day. And uh, that's a big menace over here. Um, so this particular patient on the left has a very interesting story, maybe some other day I can tell you, but what he was very kind just before he died, he was uh, very willing to do an interview for us. So when we go down to our bush patrols, I actually show his interview to the people there. And this particular photo on the right was taken just last week uh, when we went down to this uh, health aid post that hadn't been visited in three years. And uh, I'd learned that somebody had walked down just the previous uh, fortnight with tongue cancer. He had walked for seven days to the nearest hospital, but he died probably of exhaustion, and not the cancer. Yeah, I don't know how to teach rushing to this man who had fallen into the fire as a kid. Uh, That's a 16 year old girl who has lost all her front teeth. So what we see is uh, by the age of 12, 14, 15 people, children have just lost 15 to 20 to 25 teeth because Coca-Cola is like, is, has been replaced by, uh, water has replaced, uh, Coca-Cola has replaced water and they've never heard of the fluoride toothpaste. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so education is a big part of what we do because um, yeah, um, when I was small, I caught up and saw my mother and father brush their teeth and that's how I started brushing my teeth. And I saw the uh, advertisements in, uh, the TV, but these kids don't have those. They see their mother and father smoking and chewing beetle quid, and that's what they end up doing. So videos, education is going to jails, teaching schools, churches. Okay. I want to end with this particular story. I saw this patient just one month after I'd come to Papua New Guinea uh, in November, 2018. And he had a swelling on his uh, cheek here, a mucosil, and uh, for eight years. And so when he saw me, he came. Uh, we had flown there for 15 minutes and uh, he came to us and he said he wanted the mucosil removed. And I said, um, I can't do it here. He needs to come to the hospital. So he either had to take a 15 minute flight or had to walk down for two days. Uh, the next I saw the patient was only in May 2020. And I asked him, what were you doing for all this while? You know, why didn't you walk down? And he said, well, the tribal fights were on and it was not safe for me to traverse these lands. And um, so um, I waited and now there's some compensation and some peace time, and that's why I've come. 
And then he continues while he's sitting on my dental chair, he continues and says, um, but now when I go back uh, on the opposite hill, we are planning to murder a man. And I just looked at him shocked. I was like, why? Why would you want to marry a uh, murder a man? And he said, uh, well, 25 years ago, his, uh, he, his father had killed my brother and now it's time for payback. And I was just shocked and I said, why haven't, aren't there any pastors around? Haven't you heard the gospel message? You know, in my naivety, I asked him that. And he just looked at me and said, uh, no, when I want revenge, the blood within me boils and I just need blood. Blood is the only thing that will satisfy. And as I looked at him, I was just so shocked and I was looking at him with so much judgment. And then, you know, there's this gentle voice inside me that says, Cammy, look down, dare not look at that man like that because you're no different from him. Uh, because suddenly when someone wrongs you, a tooth for a tooth, an eye for an eye, and a life for a life doesn't seem like a very bad bargain. And I would say it was this man uh, that really made me think of what being a Christian is, uh, who Jesus is, what his saving love is. And um, yeah, so yeah, so after this uh, patient walked in and it was a big wilderness journey for me for the past three years, understanding who really God is and what his love is. And uh, he really showed me uh, his love in a very deep manner uh, through through visions, through um, vision, uh, through you know, through through nature, through people, through children. Uh, yeah, this is another patient we're trying to make a documentary on his life, uh, which probably I'll share with you at some time. Anyway. So thank you, Loarim Talk. Just means thank you for listening to my talk. These are my friends here. Thanks. Thank you, Gami, for uh, your testimony and your experiences. Um, no, it's not that easy, you know, for a girl who is from a metropolitan city like Delhi and to go to PNG. Uh, now we have a question and answer session and uh, which will continue our discussion. So uh, the house is open for q and session. And if any one of you are having any questions, you can uh, type it in the chat area or you can unmute yourself and you can ask. Uh, Dr. Kami, I would like to ask you a few questions. Uh, being from a yeah. city uh, like this, uh, you know, what are the challenges that you came across uh, while making, while taking up this call to go to an interior part of this country? Like you were mentioning about Bisham Katak, you were mentioning about Asha Kiran and some other hospitals whom we had visited even. In fact, you worked for EHA also. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, so what, what actually made you to take up this call and how do you see the transition and uh, how, how did you overcome the transition in your life? Uh, yeah, the call, to take up this call, I don't think it was difficult for me at all because it was something that God had put in my heart since I was 12. Uh, so really, I, I feel very much at home uh, over here. Uh, the transition between just coming to terms it's taken a long time it's been five years now and it's taken almost three and a half four years to uh, to understand um, the call actually and uh, I remember when I was coming I think it was Dr. Sujit who was telling me that God will take you places and he will show you things but he will always come through and really I can testify for that to that in my absolute aloneness he has been Emmanuel and that's really been uh, my my go to and I remember even my spiritual father uh, Dr. George Koshi uh, like my mentor he he and his wife uh, Dr. Uh, Mrs. Shereen they had told me uh, they'd asked me why do you want to go and I had my five point you know five point statement of purpose already but they said you haven't said the most important thing which was what God was going to do to me I mean they don't need me here <laughs> I, I mean uh, really, it's really what God has done in breaking me and showing me what his love really is. It has been transition. Uh, the transition has required people. Um, and God has just brought in people who've been a great support to me in, in that time. Um, I see some uh, chats, some questions in the chat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can answer those. yeah. Uh, yeah. 
Um, maybe I'll put yeah, the next so, question before you. Uh, yeah. This is from uh, Dr. Yeah. Pirucharian, sir. Did you, did Dr. Kami encounter any personal attacks or threats? No, that's another thing. I haven't encountered any personal attacks uh, as of now. Uh, I think this place is very open and very loving to uh, people from uh, other places. Like missionaries can do really well. The only problem is people from their enemy tribes. That being said, off late, uh, there was an election violence that happened last year. Every four years when the election comes, it's quite violent. Uh, but last year was pretty nasty. And um, in the last month, we had a uh, um, hospital car being held up. And uh, yeah, the attacks got a bit more personal for the hospital. But otherwise, the hospital really, in many ways, is, is like the light on a hill. So no personal attacks like that. But there are others who have had personal attacks. Pardon me. No, in terms of uh, the religious, uh, you know, freedom there and the type of religions that people practice, you know, you throw some light on that. That helps people to understand. Oh yeah. Enough, uh, so Papua New Guinea is a uh, very uh, Christian. If you Google it, it says ninety-five percent Christian, uh, but it's very animistic. So. Um, Right now, because it's it's really a country that that's jumping from what, Stone Age. Pardon me. In that case, what are the the factors for you know an attack? Uh, you know, are the scenario? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, cross attacks and so, threats. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so as I was saying, it's an animistic. I mean, they still are in animism. So right now, when Christianity has come, it's like this. Uh, it's like this conglomeration of Christianity plus the animism and um, that, that, that's really a time of confusion for many people. But uh, the attacks mostly are because of marijuana. Uh, the marijuana content here is very high. Uh, the THC content, content is very high. Alcohol and marijuana uh, play a big role in the psychosis that takes place post uh, yeah, using it because uh, there, their childhood stories are pretty violent when they see the tribal fights. So uh, yeah, so the attacks really were from opportunists who now guns have come in. Um, and um, yeah, uh, the attacks are really not to the hospital per se, but um, just the opportunists who try to make money. Uh, they just want to rob things. They just want more money to buy more alcohol. And yeah, that's that's basically the attacks. Yeah, yeah. thanks for that. and. The Another question is, how did you convince your parents before venturing into missions? Oh, yeah, that's a very nice question. <laughs> My parents are pretty cool. Um, when I went to Kashmir, I went to Anantnag um, when I, uh, in 2014. It was at that time I was really testing waters and I realized that my parents don't have a problem sending me to Anantnag, which is known for terrorism. And I was like, hmm. But my parents, uh, both my father and mother, are pioneers in their own way and um, um, they have always allowed me to do uh, go and experience life and yeah I, I don't know <laughs> you should probably ask them okay uh, this question is like how was it that you learned their language does it have script so Enga Enga has 500,000 people, at least that was the last survey. And um, uh, it's the largest language speaking, what single language speaking group of the country. Uh, so mostly they speak in Engen, but the trade language is Tok Pisin, which is really a Pigeon English. Uh, I, I speak Tok Pisin. I know some words of Enga I'm learning. Uh, I know the words that are important for when the patient sits on my chair, but I do need a translator. So my assistant is my translator. Yeah. So uh, I have one more question from my side. Uh, see, uh, during your testimony, you shared that, you know, you're not for a, uh, in favor, you're not in favor of a private clinic or, a, you know, a regular commercial setup. Actually, what factors uh, made you think, you know, against the private practice or, a, you know, commercial, uh, you know, a dental setup? Um. From the little experience that I had, uh, 
the three years that I was running a clinic and that one month which where I was with a private practice, um, I think the biggest challenge for me was uh, how to you know, do the balance between how much you take from patients and how much is enough. And um, I, I mean, I would say that's something if it would be great if our dental colleges taught us that. Uh, but um, yeah, that was my major thing. Uh, what really put me off was how it was a very commercialized uh, money making endeavor uh, and you know, getting lost in, in, in that and forgetting the person. So I remember attending a Saline uh, course where uh, that's where it really hit me in one of the uh, EMFI conferences where we need to look at the person as the whole. It's just not the tooth or the leg or the liver, but it's it's a spiritual, emotional, mental, psychological, physical aspect. That's what health is all about. And most importantly, the spiritual aspect. Um, and what I was experiencing in Delhi, especially now that you have you know, with BDS, 30,000 BD, uh, graduates uh, coming out of colleges, 230, 260 PG seats in government and the rest is just, um, yeah, you pay huge money and then you do your post-graduation and then it's, it's a big rat race. And then you end up in clinics that don't pay enough. And um, unless you come from, you know, heavy families who can, you know, set up clinics for you, it's it's quite a dark hole for many many dentists. I don't know if that answers your question. But. Yeah, thank you for uh, you know touching that aspect also. In fact, that's the problem where you know many of the dental uh, dentists are struggling today. You know, finding the right place to work and the uh, you know uh, with dignity, uh, with a decent pay. That's also a challenge in India today. Now, uh, do you? have any suggestion for this generation who are like you know keen on working uh, in some places uh, you know places of their choice and expecting some uh, decent pay and all that instead of venturing into the places where there's a need instead of venturing i yeah. mean look at india we yeah. have so much to do uh, if we look at the eha hospitals or we look at the other mission hospitals there are populations waiting for uh, some treatment. Uh, something that I think I have learned over the years is, yes, we learn dentistry, uh, but the community dentistry aspect has so much, uh, so much that we can give to society, can do for society. If it's just, you know, just education. I mean, for the first one and one and a half, two years, all that I did was going and telling people over here, hey, you know, you have teeth. And uh, unlike India or Africa, uh, where, you know, you have the miswak or the neem or, you know, some indigenous way of taking care of your teeth. Here they had only um, betel quid. You know, why they chew betel quid? It's because, uh, you know, the mouth stinks and they don't have an alternative. And then it's also, you know, a psychogenic agent. And then it keeps them warm in the cold. And in India, I mean, I, it, I used to get really bugged when I would look at drivers, truck drivers, bus drivers, people who are you know, doing mundane jobs, just chewing on pan and gutka. And um, uh, I remember I was in Bism Katak and the, the sweeper was cleaning the gutter. And I, he was just behind my dental clinic. And I said, hey, come in, come in, let me talk to you. And then I said, why are you chewing? Do you know it's bad for you? And this guy goes, madam, have you ever cleaned a gutter before? And I said, no. He's like, be my guest. Why don't you smell it while you do it? And then I realized, you know, there's a reason why everybody does what they do. And uh, anyway, uh, to answer your question, this, this, I think, for, look at the, look at the oral cancer cases that are coming out. Uh, we don't even have decent um, uh, data uh, to even put it out there. The rural communities, uh, in Orissa, at least I can speak about Orissa. I know that women, men kids, they're all, you know, chewing on, on just that. And I, 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 in 2021, when I came for a year to India, uh, I worked for two months in uh, Bismarck. In those two months, I saw nine oral cancer cases. Four or five of them were up below 35. The need is so much. What we learn in dental school is, is one thing. But if we really open our eyes, there's so much more to do. I mean, I get 
um, I get a lot of messages from friends and juniors and some seniors who say, oh, Kenny, what you're doing is amazing. We'd never be able to do what you're doing. And I tell them, I can't do what you are doing. You know, being an ethical uh, dental practitioner in a private clinic is, is a huge mission of, of its own. Um, and uh, everyone's called, everyone's got a calling. I mean, sometimes we just need to sit at the Lord's feet and see what is my calling. I remember very clearly, you know, um, after I came back from Orissa and I was in Delhi because it was a culture, a reverse culture shock for me. I was just like, I don't know what I'm going to do with my life. I took a big paper and I, you know, you know, put all, all, the, all my visions I had and looked at what my possibilities were. And there were literally none. I found one, one uh, organization in Bangalore that, you know, worked with my mission, my, my vision. So, um, yeah, I don't know how to answer that question. I mean, the need is so much. Okay, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> Coming and working here has really changed the way I look at dentistry. Uh, aesthetic dentistry is, is something that, you know, you have a lot of courses. I even did an implantology course, but I'm just saying, you know, you have a lot of courses. People do that. You, you know, uh, it's a skill. It's a, it's a good skill. Uh, this, is, this might sound controversial, but I came to Papua New Guinea and the, and the man who really clears our dustbins has one of the most beautiful resplendent smiles I've ever seen. And he has no front teeth. I mean, I'm sure he looked very nice with, you know, false teeth, but it really made me think about where is dentistry heading? You know, look at the need that's there in India and look at what courses and fellowships and, you know, other things are out there. I don't know if that answers any question, but, or if it confuses you more, but. Um, Ma'am, to come back in the India after spending only two weeks. Uh, this is an incomplete question. I don't know uh, what was their intention. Pardon? The question was incomplete. Uh, okay, uh, friends, now we have uh, with us uh, Dr. Vagis Phillips. Uh, sir is associated with the Mission Aviation Fellowship. As we uh, heard in the testimony that, you know, Mission Aviation Fellowship was an you know, uh, a good uh, co-partner in the work at uh, Papua New Guinea. So, sir, uh, over to you. Uh, can you share your thoughts? So, um, Enga is one of the, as, as Kemi was saying, Enga is one of the most violent, most remote places, probably the last place on the earth. And to go there willingly and to serve all these years, I think it's really amazing. Hats off to Kami and hats off to her God who motivated her and who keeps inspiring her to stay on there and do what she's doing. Amazing work. Um, as she showed some pictures of Mission Aviation Fellowship, I work with MAF and uh, uh, one of the things that we do is to reach these remote locations and uh, uh, provide services that the people in remote locations need. And a lot of it is medical evacuation. And what uh, Enga Hospital is doing is to take medical teams to these remote places, conduct clinics, and we fly them back to their base hospital. So without the planes, uh, it's impossible to get there. Some places you can maybe walk for a day or two. Some places you have to walk for a week or two weeks to reach. So it's impossible to get any help to many of these places. So MF comes in to serve these kind of remote locations. And uh, we have work in, in Africa, South America. You may have heard of uh, Jim Milliot and his team. The pilot, Nate Saint, who flew, was, uh, was a pilot for MAF, and uh, they were all killed in the uh, jungles of Ecuador. Uh, so that is, that is MAF, and mainly delivering help to remote places. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, sir, and uh, thank you, Dr. Kemi. Uh, You know, as professionals, uh, we have so many options to work and uh, know, to, to take up. But ultimately, after all uh, that we do in our life, you know, one 
thing that touched me in your testimony is the safest place is the center of the god's will and uh, you know uh, it's very inspiring because you are in the safest hands when you are in the center of the god's will and uh, i thank and praise god for leading you to a, a region where you can be a great blessing and uh, will continue to pray for you will remember your work in our prayers and will uphold you and uh, continue to encourage continue to motivate the new generation of dentists in india and across the world may your story inspire many to join the work and uh, you know bless many across the globe um, so can i request uh, yeah so before we close with the closing prayer you have anything to share Ami? Uh, VP, sir, uh, if nothing, uh, yeah. Yeah, no, I just, uh, yeah, I just want to say that, um, yeah, something that I really learned over here is, you know, we keep hearing uh, the whole purpose of a Christian is to know God and make him known. Uh, but something that has really uh, been drilled into me is that it's also allowing God to know you fully to be known by God, as Psalm 139, the end says, know me, search me and know me, see if there's any wicked way in me. And uh, it's only in us allowing him to know us completely, allowing that uh, where he can really show us where and what he wants to do with our life. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you for spending your time, valuable time and sharing your story. I'm sure it's going to inspire us many more in the days to come. Uh, may I request Dr. VP sir to close today's session with a word of prayer? Yes. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time to listen to what you do in our we thank you for the stories that Kami has told us. Thank you for the way in which you and kept her inspired to do your will and purpose in her life. We especially remember people in the, especially the Yanga province where she serves. Pray for the people. Pray for Pray that you will, will bring peace into that nation where there is so much of violence, so much of hatred among different tribes. Lord, we thank you for the few who are uh, serving in these places. We pray for your blessing upon Kami as she continues to serve you and serve the people of Enga. May she be enabled, strengthened to love them as you would love them. Thank you for the burden that you have placed on our heart to reach these remote people. We pray for each one who has listened to this session and these stories. Pray that you will continue to keep your fire burning within us, that we may serve you in the way that you call us to, reaching out to others, to love others as you would love them. Thank you this deep. Thank Amen. you. Amen. Thank you, sir. And friends, one thing that we can surely uh, do is to pray for those who are working in the most interior parts of the world. And let us continue to remember Dr. Kami and her work in PNG and all of our friends who are working there in Mission Aviation Fellowship. And uh, let us continue continue to remember them in our prayers. We thank and praise God for her life and uh, we pray that, let's pray that uh, her life will inspire many to uh, join the Lord's work in various parts of the world. Thank you for joining. Have a blessed evening.